As Russia's war on Ukraine slogs into a third month, how is the world helping Ukraine? What is in the United States $800 million aid package and is it enough? From sending weapons to sheltering children and preparing to rebuild. Now, the inside story, helping Ukraine. Patsy Kuswara, VOA White House Bureau Chief. As Russia's war on Ukraine enters a third month, battlefield tactics are shifting. Russia says its next phase of the war has begun with an offensive in eastern Ukraine. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said Russia seeks complete liberation of Donetsk and Luhansk regions. In 2014, Russian separatists took control of those regions, which Russia now says are independent and no longer belong to Ukraine. The port city of Mariupol has been devastated by Russian attacks and is a key point of control in Moscow's perceived plans to build a land corridor to Crimea, annexed by Russia also in 2014. Meantime, the city of Lviv in western Ukraine was targeted by Russian missiles, killing at least seven people. President Joe Biden, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau pledged to send more artillery to Ukraine following a call with other allied leaders. Biden announced another $800 million in U.S. aid to Ukraine, which includes heavy artillery and other weapons he said will support the country's needs as it battles a new Russian strategy of moving the war to the Donbass region. This is the second package dropped in a span of one week, making the total U.S. security assistance to the country to about $3.25 billion so far. We'll go beyond the numbers later in the show. Already, the Biden administration seems set to discuss the economic impact of Russia's invasion and potentially Ukraine's reconstruction at November's G20 summit. It's a plan likely to create a further rift in the economic forum, which includes Russia. As the war rages on in Ukraine, President Joe Biden wants Russia removed from the group of 20 largest economies and for the invasion's fallout to be included on the G20 summit agenda, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki told VOA. It is not uncommon for events that are impacting the global community as Ukraine is and the Russian invasion of Ukraine to play a central role at international forum. And their economic recovery and rebuilding and reconstruction is going to be something that the global community is going to be involved in and address. This puts Indonesian President Joko Widodo, this year's G20 chair and host of the November summit in Bali, in a bind. He and other middle power members have their own agenda. President Widodo's desire is to make sure that the G20 mandate uh, can be upheld, uh, make sh making sure that as a representative of emerging economies, the agenda of recovery from pandemic, including the prices of uh, energy, uh, basic prices of goods, uh, can be affordable for all. Following its 2014 annexation of Crimea, Moscow was kicked out of the group of eight leading industrial nations, now known as the G7. However, it's unlikely Russia will be removed from the G20, a much wider grouping with more competing interests and no formal mechanism to expel a member. So far, Russian President Vladimir Putin intends to attend the summit with Beijing support. President Biden isn't going to be in the room with them. I imagine Prime Minister Trudeau won't, several of the Europeans won't, which puts Jakarta in a very tough position here because are they willing to trade Putin's attendance for having five or six others not come? Ambassador Diantri Sahjani, a G20 co-Sherpa, told VOA that Indonesia will listen to members' views while maintaining G20's role as an economic cooperation forum. Responding to criticism that Western demands to exclude Moscow disrupt the summit's agenda and create division, Saki said that Putin has shown himself to be a pariah in the world and has no place at international forums. It's not just governments that are helping to support Ukraine's needs. There are many charitable organizations doing tremendous work in Ukraine and around the world. But as the war intensifies, charities in the U.S. are seeing a slowdown in donations. VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias shows us how these nonprofits and their volunteers are adapting. Volunteering is a priority for Vladislav Shpakov, 
who immigrated from Kyiv in 2016. As the co-owner of a residential moving company, Shpakov spends around $400 a trip transporting donated goods from Virginia to Delaware. Their ultimate destination, his home country, Ukraine. We're losing some money because we, we still need to pay for the gas uh, and, you know, we have employees. But we are Ukrainian and we need to do something, you know, to try to help. It takes helping hands, cash and in-kind donations for U.S.-based charities to reach Ukrainians in need. And Russia's intensified attacks makes matters worse. As the war drags on, donor interest is slowing, while humanitarian needs climb. Charities are rethinking their strategies. There are quite many warehouses all throughout the United States, and I think people now are realizing that they need to focus on what they are accepting and in what capacity we are focusing on tactical medicine. Unless donated goods are worth more than shipping costs, some charities aren't bothering to send them overseas. Donations are used to help the local economy too when possible, says the founder of U.S.-based World Central Kitchen, Chef Jose Andres. His team mobilizes restaurant workers to serve up fresh meals to Ukrainians. If we import all the food, we'll make the farmers even poorer. The idea is to act and to buy locally. The European Union has allocated 143 million euros for people affected by the war. In March, the Biden administration announced an additional $1 billion for humanitarian assistance in Ukraine. Some think more could be done. There are different uh, ways to spend the money, and if you try to cover them all, this is not going to be enough. Um, for refugees, the best thing to do is to supply large amounts of food or medicine. When it comes to individual donors, the nonprofit Global Giving says there's a certain slowdown of support. This is turning into one of the fastest growing refugee crisis, and there's a lot of concern for what does it look like in the longer run for us to be able to continue to support refugees. Boris Levonenko, who was born in Kharkiv, remains optimistic that altruism will prevail. Gathering medical supplies for his former countrymen makes him feel better, even if he loses some business at his auto repair shop. I have to be at the shop and run the business. Unfortunately, I can't do it. We can make money later after we win. Veronica Valderas Iglesias for VOA News, Arlington, Virginia. $3 billion in U.S. aid to Ukraine since Russia's invasion is in addition to billions more from allies and Ukraine's neighbors. And Ukraine is asking for even more. Michael O'Hanlon is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, specializing in defense and foreign policy issues. He helped us break down what Ukraine wants, what the U.S. and NATO is applying, and where the war turns now. We're trying to help Ukraine prevail whatever that means. I'm not sure we have a clear uh, idea of what it means for Ukraine to succeed, or at least to suffer less egregiously than it might otherwise. I think these are all different shades of, you know, of, of catastrophe, but nonetheless, some worse than others. Clearly, if Putin succeeds in killing Zelensky, uh, you know, eliminating the Ukrainian government and seizing much, most or all of the country, that's a worse outcome than if he takes parts of the South, East and Southeast. And, uh, and so, you know, we're in it for the long haul and the long haul could be a lot longer than this spring. And uh, what, so I hope in addition to thinking about military assistance and economic sanctions, we're also thinking about plausible end states where this conflict might somehow be wound down and then think of what we can do to encourage the parties working with other outside actors even the Chinese, perhaps, to try to get to some kind of a place we can all live with compared to the alternative of this turning into a multi-month or even multi-year conflict. But for the short term, we're just trying to help the Ukrainians not lose. Obviously, air power has been the place where most of the debate has occurred so far, whether it's fixed wing aircraft or rotary wing. As you expect, a bigger fight in more wide open terrain in the east 
I think you do have to acknowledge that Ukrainian air power may be important. And also the Russians have not been able to dominate the skies as much as they wished. And that's a good thing. Uh, it prevents them from concentrating an airborne assault, for example, or a mass attack on some kind of Ukrainian armor. So some ability to contest the skies is important. I think uh, surface to air missiles are probably even more crucial than aircraft, but I have no objection to some uh, numbers of aircraft. We may have to think about which ones and in what quantities and uh, which ones are maintained and what the tactical use would be. Because again, I don't really think we want to encourage the Ukrainians to attack Russia on Russian soil, for example, or otherwise go on the large scale offensive. I think that's only uh, a fight they can lose and, and it will probably uh, increase the risks of Russia retaliating directly against NATO, at least certain specific places like supply convoy crossings. Uh, but I do think that uh, giving the Ukrainians some maneuver capability, including with armor, makes sense at this juncture for the battles that loom. Well, if the Ukrainians had enough air power, they could go after Russian convoys or columns on roads to the extent that conditions require the Russians to sometimes use the roads or the rail lines. The Ukrainians could actually attack those kinds of locations, but I don't know that they're going to have that much capability. So I think we need to think uh, about their air power first and foremost as a way of interfering with Russian dominance of the skies. It's a little bit more defensive. It's trying to prevent Russia from having the you know, air supremacy that would enable them to move airborne forces around at will within Ukraine and also to be able to attack all sorts of different locations within Ukraine um, you know, on a moment's notice or 20 minutes notice. So I, I like the idea of any Russian pilot going up in the sky, uh, wondering if he'll really get to his target and get back home alive. That's the most important thing we can do is create that doubt and therefore discourage the mass movements and mass attacks that might otherwise happen uh, from airborne or aerial positions. The western city of Lviv was seen as a safe haven for Ukrainians to seek shelter without leaving the country. That is until a Russian shelling this week. VOA's Anna Kosyshenko shows us how a local businessman turned his office into a makeshift shelter for displaced women and children. The shelling was massive. Bombs or whatever it was, they were dropped straight from planes. I started shouting, Yulia, Yulia, and then I heard her say, I'm alive. During Russian shelling of Mariupol in early March, a bomb hit the apartment of Tatiana, a Russian-speaking city resident. I heard someone shout in the basement, a bomb has hit an apartment on the eighth floor. It turned out to be ours. We didn't even go up to see it, we just spent the next six days in the basement. The only thing we have left to remind us of home is the keys to the apartment. Since early March, attacks by the Russian military have intensified, and Tatiana quickly realized that although she had lost her apartment, she could still save herself and her family. We knew we had to get out. I had a broken leg, but still I was running fast, because I knew I couldn't afford to stay behind. Tatiana says Russian soldiers did not allow people to leave Mariupol to go to other cities in Ukraine through the humanitarian corridors, but instead forced Mariupol residents leaving the city to travel to Russian-occupied territories. We knew they were taking people to Volodarsk. It's either the so-called Donetsk Republic or already Russia, I'm not sure. But why? We wanted to stay in Ukraine. Tatiana did not want to go to Russia even for free. Instead, she spent all her money to hire a car and go to Berdansk. There, volunteers helped the family get to Lviv, where Ukrainian women's rights activist Lubov Maksimovich organized a shelter near the train station. Our shelter opened on the second day of war. Maksimovich has been fighting for women's rights for almost 25 years. During this time, she has started many initiatives to help women on their career path. But since the start of the invasion, Maksimovich has been supporting women in a different way. I have a project called Economic Security for Women. I contacted women who we were working with on this project and who were preparing to start a business and I told them about my idea to start a shelter. One Lviv businessman agreed to give up his office for the needs of the shelter for displaced women with children. 
I called him and said, Alek, because of the war, I need a space where I can accommodate women. And he said, I have an office, come and see. Since the start of Russia's invasion, over 250 women with children have found refuge in this pop-up shelter, where they are given free hot meals and psychological assistance if they need it. Ukrainian refugees are still at risk from being victimized by human trafficking, says Lubov Maksimovich. An ongoing war creates a huge risk. People do not know where they are going. Some do not have enough documents with them. To protect women from human traffickers at the border, volunteers are organizing centralized routes to Spain, where locals are waiting for Ukrainian women. They have an agreement between the Ukrainian Women's Consortium and the Huelva community to create a shelter for women with children. There, women are offered temporary accommodation or even refugee status. But most of them, around 90 percent, apply for temporary residence only because they want to return home. On average, women spend about two, three days in the shelter. Then most of them continue their journey abroad. But Tatiana is in no hurry to leave Ukraine. Anna Kostuchenko for Voice of American News, Lviv, Ukraine. In March, President Biden announced the United States would accept 100,000 Ukrainian refugees fleeing Russia's invasion. For over 12 years, the state of Washington has taken in more than 6,000 Ukrainian refugees and now is preparing to welcome more. VOA's Natasha Moskovaya has the latest from Seattle, Washington. A drum school in Seattle is the place where recently arrived Ukrainian refugees meet with community volunteers and local organizations that are to provide some of the refugees' basic needs. It's the second time Putin is rescuing us. Originally, we are from Donetsk. In 2014, when fighting started there, my family and I, back then we had one kid and my wife was five months pregnant, fled to Zaporizhia, started a new life, lived there for eight years, and now we had to leave Zaporizhia, this time with three kids. According to Olga Okhapkina, founder of the Nashi Immigrants Health Board nonprofit organization, Ukrainian refugees arrive in Washington daily and the numbers continue to grow. Unfortunately, uh, due to war and uh, immigration, not, not because of, of their choice, they, they come in very emotional drain. So we try to collaborate with many, many psychologists and provide um, free consultation to to support people and, and and help them the main request for people uh, where to live uh, how to find the job how to uh, work with a status how to find the education to uh, to learn english how to uh, how to help their kids and uh, and mental mental support as well. Officials from the local resettlement agencies admit they're stretched thin because of the coronavirus pandemic, greater Seattle's housing crisis, and efforts to resettle Afghan refugees too. Affordable housing in our greater Seattle area has been um, for years in crisis and, um, and it continues to be. And so when you have local population who's looking for housing and you have people across the country who are moving into the greater Seattle for the job opportunities, um, you know, with the tech gigs and all of that, and then on top of it you have refugees who are coming and have to compete on such a very hot market. We have a place to live. We live with an American family, but it's someone else's house. We need to rent a place, find a job, put kids in school. After Russian forces began the shelling of Kiev, Daria Kucherets decided to leave. Her husband Boris took them to the border with Romania and then went back to fight. Oh, yeah. oh we just say, okay, goodbye. Yeah. Just don't have drama. Uh, everywhere people helping us, in every cities, in every country, in... Uh, even when I came in the United States, I want also say that I am very grateful to and thankful for all these people because um, they help um, a lot of us. They give uh, uh, clothing, they give uh, buy, um, they buy, uh, bikes and uh, helmets yeah. for boys and toys for them and clothing and beds. Yes, and also they 
um, give some card for food, you know, for <laughs> it was, uh, it just was so surprised oh, and uh, <laughs> I really don't know how to pay it back. Uh, to pay back, <laughs> yes, because it's uh, really like all world helping. Daria speaks four languages and is bursting with ideas, so her sister Alexandra is confident Daria will quickly find her footing in the US once she gets her work permit. They are less confident that their connections with relatives in Russia, torn apart by the war, will ever be restored. Natasha Mosgovaya, VOA News, Seattle. The United States and more than 30 nations have imposed economic sanctions on Russia and its leaders as punishment for invading Ukraine. Historically, trade embargoes and economic sanctions have been utilized to end conflicts or facilitate international negotiations. How effective might it be in this case? Take a deep dive into how economic sanctions work and don't. Russia is facing economic sanctions over its invasion of Ukraine from dozens of countries. The sanctions target a vast range of sectors. They also target individuals, including Russian President Vladimir Putin himself, his two adult daughters, as well as high-level government officials and leading Russian businessmen. The sanctions have cut Russian banks out of a key financial messaging system and frozen the assets of Russia's central bank. Russian aircraft cannot take off from, fly over, or land in dozens of countries. The U.S. has banned oil and natural gas imports from Russia, while many European countries have announced plans to scale back the use of Russian energy. Import bans affect dozens of other Russian products spanning industrial goods to high-end items. The U.S. has suspended normal trade relations with Russia while European countries are taking similar measures. The effectiveness of sanctions is hotly debated, with both proponents and opponents citing specific cases. Proponents say sanctions helped bring Iran to the negotiating table in 2015 and to agree to limit its nuclear activities. In South Africa, decades of international sanctions played a role in ending that country's apartheid government in 1990. The use of sanctions became prominent following World War I as countries sought ways to avoid the horrors of another world war. U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt used an oil embargo in 1940 to successfully persuade Spain to remain neutral during World War II. However, just one year later, Roosevelt cut off Japan's ability to buy U.S. oil with drastically different results. Japan, soon afterward, bombed Pearl Harbor and increased its military assault throughout Asia. Part of its objective was to acquire more oil. An economic blockade of Nazi Germany also failed to deter the plans of Adolf Hitler. Moreover, the German leader cited concerns about sanctions as a reason for his territorial conquest. A study looking at more than 170 case studies spanning a century of economic measures found sanctions were at least partially successful only about a third of the time. Failures cited by the study include Cuba, where decades of U.S. sanctions have not led to the fall of the communist government, and North Korea, which has not given up its nuclear program in the face of international sanctions. The PIIE study found that sanctions are most successful when a country's goals are modest, such as the release of political prisoners. They are much less successful when seeking regime change and democratization and they are the least successful when trying to stop a military operation. The sanctions against Russia have caused the ruble to swing in value and inflation in the country to rise. Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin acknowledged in April the situation is the most difficult in three decades for Russia. However, the sanctions have not so far stopped Moscow's military operation. Russia's foreign minister said in March that Russia would adjust its economy to the sanctions and that they would make the country stronger. Follow me on Twitter at Piwida Kuswara and follow VOA News on Instagram and Facebook. Online, stay up to date at voanews.com.
Thanks for being with us. See you next week on The Inside Story.